We'll start the recording. Done. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for being willing to shift to today, Tuesday, the week, the Thanksgiving week, 8.30 in the morning, um, November 22nd. Um, I need to, uh, since we're conducting this virtually, I need to make sure that the committee members can hear and be heard. So I will call on everyone and then I will be turning it over to Margaret to just quickly over give us an overview of the agenda for the day and then the design team is, is all here. So as I call out your names, just let me know if, if everything's okay. Jonathan? Here. Allison? Here. Paul? Present. Mike? Here. Sean? Here. Simone? Here. Alicia? Here. And I think I just got everyone that's currently here and I'll call out names when if I as I see other people joining us. Um, so and I'll just let me check attendees that no one came in that way. Okay, we're fine. Hey Margaret, I'm turning yep. it over to you. Oh, we've got the screen sharing issue again. Uh, Paul has to enable screen sharing. He is host. So somewhere, Paul, okay. on your... I'm good. Okay, you're good? Yep. Okay, can everybody see this? Yes. It's a fairly short agenda, um, but I know we're going to spend... Um, Denisco has a pretty big update, and I see that the Thornton Tomasetti folks have joined us. So they will also be helping with the update on sustainability, energy use and modeling. So that's the big item. And then just as a reminder, our next meeting is December 2nd. So with that, I'm gonna stop the share and I'm gonna turn it over to Denisco to get launched. Good morning. I think Tim, this is your show. I just want to make sure that uh, we do want to do it in the order as presented. We're going to do design updates, and then we're going to go into an energy model update with Ali and Thornton Tomasetti. Just unless anyone has any objection, that's how we're going to do it, and we're going to start. Yeah, no, you're in control of the order. So. <laughs> All the power, Tim. That, feels that's good. Too, much, <laughs> too much control for me. <laughs> Okay, so how we're going to do this, we're just going to um, go through the site plan, building plans, and then we have some videos of some interior spaces that some that you have seen before and some that you will be seeing in this format for the first time today. Tim, um, um, before you get going, I just wanted to introduce um, Bill Brown, Natalie Brown from Brown Sardina, our landscape architects, um, and then with Thornton Thomas Setti. We have Ali Manchaka, if I say that correctly, Ali, I always butcher you, Rebecca, and I think I saw Ermac. Yeah, right? that was Ermac's link that I sent to Rebecca, and so Rebecca just changed her name to Rebecca. Oh, okay, yeah. perfect. Um, since we, we we're going to start with the site plan, and since we do have Bill and Natalie here, maybe they can just uh, uh, spend a minute and talk about anything that has been updated on the site plan. We have had some discussions with um, the staff in terms of outdoor learning. So we've uh, adjusted what our targets are for uh, formal outdoor learning space, the amount of cultivation space that will be dedicated. Um, and then there are just a few updates that are shown in the site plan here that maybe Bill or Natalie can speak to. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we made some site plan updates uh, to show kind of what we're going to be uh, designing for asphalt play. I know that's been asked about of um, what is actually going to be shown for spaces um, in the asphalt areas and also expanded the design a little bit on the uh, rain gardens um, and the cultivation area. So in the asphalt play, we're showing the line work uh, that we're going to be working with right now. Um, there's 
uh, the line work is just going to be painted. Um, we're kind of following the uh, same design uh, features with the circles and reiterating that throughout the entire space. And can, wrapping can, can you just point out where that is as Natalie's talking? Okay. Talk about the younger kids play area. So um, over on the left side, that is the younger kids play area. So with the younger kids play area, um, we have some um, meandering uh, line work that leads you to different create areas for chalk play. Um, also different um, bag tosses and then leads you over into the map of the world. Uh, the map of the world is kind of the central area, uh, which is access for both uh, younger kids play and older kids play. And then as we progress over to the right side of the plan, uh, we're heading into more of the zone of the older kids play area, which includes four square. We have a uh, running feet to yard um, track that comes over that wraps around for the whole meandering path if uh, people want to connect it. Um, and then it wraps around to the first outdoor classroom, which is indicated in the blue. Um, we are intending to put some stepping stones. So we kind of want this rain garden to actually be accessible for students to explore within it. Um, but we also have the overlook uh, circle that's to the right of the top blue uh, section, um, which is for kind of more of a classroom setting people to gather and um, see what's happening within this area. Uh, the dark green uh, to the right is actually what we're going to be pr uh, proposing as microforests. So we're going to be breaking this section up into four different areas one of a micro pine forest, one of a micro hardwood forest, one of a first succession forest, and then also uh, having meadow off to the uh, right side of those areas. And within these micro forests, uh, we're also going to be having um, uh, outdoor nature play and um, more of a gathering um, area for the students as well. The idea behind the microforest is that we'll primarily plant it with uh, trees that are very small in the two to two and a half foot range, uh, but interspersed with some larger trees as well. So that over time, you'll see how uh, these um, forest environments uh, change over time. And then as we continue along the path down towards the south into the next blue area, it's another uh, rain garden, but with a different design language, um, showing more of uh, linear stones wrapping around. And then that leads us to more of the uh, formal uh, outdoor learning area at the south. Um, the formal outdoor learning area is going to um, house the cultivation area, which I believe it was between 800 to 900 square feet of cultivation area that um, was needed. And uh, we are going to be showing that. I think one thing to realize with regard to the um, asphalt play areas is we're trying to just, we're trying to define the area of asphalt play uh, the area of color that would be applied and a notion of what kinds of um, opportunities there are. As we go through the process, after we get through schematic design, we'll have the opportunity to, to present a number of different alternatives with other people's input as to what they would actually want to see as we develop the project further in the future. So, so if I could just um, pause for a sec, Tim, was the slide before this, was this this is zoomed in and then slide before shows a bit more of the uh, site. Okay. And then um, when we start, that's okay. So you can go back. I thought I saw the cultivate well, and all the images. Oh, well, Donna, um, one of the things that we should talk about for a moment, if we go back to the first slide, is that um, we have made some minor adjustments to the field. Um, and this, this plan of the field doesn't quite reflect it. Uh, we were able to um, um, expand the field slightly um, to the east in order to potentially accommodate a freestanding uh, baseball backstop, uh, which was discussed in our last meeting. 
Um, so we have been able to accommodate that. And we are showing on the plans uh, a location for the potential for the uh, uh, comfort station area um, at the top left. It's not shown on this plan, um, but we are showing it on the plan. So it will be prepared for December. Can you explain the comfort station bill for those? That yeah, what we're doing is we're showing a, a, just a box that's a 10 by 20 box that could house a comfort station. There was discussion of potential about doing uh, compost toilets there. Um, and um, there will be electricity conduits that will be supplied there as well. Um, actually, we are gonna be, need to supply electricity for an irrigation controller. Uh, and we're going to be, need to supply a water meter as well for the irrigation system. So that'll be part of the plans that are prepared um, for the next submission. And then um, I think just to, to go back maybe more towards the design of, I, I, I just have an adverse reaction to asphalt play area, but to the, to the paved play area, um, maybe Mike and your team, Allison and, and some others could start thinking about it and maybe even having a subcommittee that might help us design the lines and activities that would occur in that area. Okay. Yeah, with other um, districts, um, if you do put a committee together like that, what would be great is if you could do a web search and um, you know show us images of um, uh, games or things that, that you would like to have included. And then we can see if we can incorporate them into the design. And, and we can come up with ideas too. We actually, at one of our recent schools, the, the kids, the students actually told us what they really wanted to see in the play areas for lines and games and things like that. So we would welcome that as an opportunity and happy to host a couple of um, meetings or, you know, working group sessions with some students, if you think that would be something you'd be interested in. Okay. And to add, and sorry, just to add to that, we also um, worked with one of the teachers, I think for the fourth grade class, I don't know if this is the same project, Donna, um, where we provided large scale drawings of the play area and then little templates of all these little components so that they could actually participate and and start laying it out you know it, it just for fun just for understanding how this puts uh, gets put together it's just one more thing that we can use to draw the kids into the process i'm sorry what okay now kathy <laughs> okay just uh, uh two things one i wanted to acknowledge that ben uh Tammy and Rupert have all joined us. So I just want to make sure they can hear and be heard. Tammy? Yes. Hi. Hi. Ben? Hello. Good morning. And Rupert, although Rupert's uh, name says Ben, it's Rupert. Hi, Rupert. Hi. I'm the other Ben. He's the other Ben. So um, I, I think you answered the question I was going to have on a some of this is a design template that would allow us to get a cost estimate on it, but um, you can get a lot more input. So, you know, both for the kids, the parents, um, the teachers. So just at some point we, we should figure out whether it's a subcommittee or however you wanna do it, but to let the community know that. So as I'm gonna be starting to talk about these designs, but let them know where it's a work in progress as opposed to this is it. That, so that was a, a, a just confirmation. And then on, on things like the around the world diagram that I've seen at a couple different schools, I'm hoping that Ben and Rupert or others will get a good sense of uh, durability, you know, that um, as you sweep them or clear snow, you know, do do they stay fresh and beautiful five years, 10 years, you know, so the less fancy to me often lasts longer in terms of the way they look, they don't get chipped and beat up. So I don't I don't have a sense of that because 
both schools I saw that had this had just opened a year ago, you know, so mm -hmm. it, what, I didn't have any, what does this look like after five years or 10 years so that we get something, trees I can understand better, little trees get bigger. <laughs> um, but but it's it's the um, flourishes on whatever you want to call the hard surface, Donna, that yeah. I agree that if we go overboard on it, um, it will not look great after the beginning. And so I'd like to be able to say we're we're building things to last. So it, it's a comment and a question on that. Yeah, Bill, do you, do you want to comment on the durability? It's painted, correct? Yeah, it is painted. And um, there's a couple things. One is um, we're beginning to do some research into um, a product called Street Print, uh, which we think is more durable. And we're in the process of doing that now. The other is that I know that it, at Sunita Williams that um, they purchased a, a plow for um, the, the area that they do plow that is painted, that is a, a special plow blade that is fiberglass and it doesn't scrape up the surfaces as much. So that's something that we could talk about in the future as well. And the other thing is that, you know, we take a look at this and uh, it's, it's sort of unfortunate in a way because there are areas that are pinched in terms of where a plow could actually get through, like between the cafeteria and um, the rectangular uh, play area uh, that's to the north. Um, you know, maybe there are some areas that we really don't do a whole lot of painting because we're concerned about uh, plow marks and things like that for the future. So, I see several hands are up. Um, I can resume role as chair, Mike. I just want to really support the idea that uh, was shared about bringing this to students about what games, what lines, and uh, I know Tammy and Allison. Uh, or I presume I should say no, uh, but I, I feel confident that that they would uh, be excited, excited and eager as would I to be interacting with students around that dimension. So I just want to plus one that and, and really encourage us to involve students in that process. Thank you. So Mike, maybe we can start after the first of the year, right? After everyone gets settled, that'd be awesome. And and the other the other component too is the actual play structures. We we have a budget amount for the play structures, but we will certainly wanna start that conversation sooner rather than later as well, as soon as we get through schematic design. So even start starting to think about who may wanna participate in that. I, I don't know if it's the larger community, Kathy, if it resides with the school department, but uh, we definitely wanna involve the community in those areas. Paul. Thank you. Um, I have four comments I'd like you to consider. One is on the map, um, I think it's really important that we don't use the Mercator map, which is the map that we're used to seeing because it overemphasizes the Northern Hemisphere that there are different maps out there that sort of really should, reflects the true, you know, it puts the equator in the middle of the map instead of on the bottom third of the map and things like that. So it really reflects the true land mass of the world. I think that's a really learning, that's a real learning uh, tool that we have the opportunity to put in here because it's an aha moment for a lot of people who are used to seeing just a flat map that overemphasizes the northern hem hemisphere typically. Um, so that's one. The second is in my experience playing basketball, you like the two basketball courts to be side by side, because if there's a game going on, you want to be shooting at the hoop right next to it so you can keep an eye on the other game instead of it having it be um, far apart. So I think that should be a consideration because um, sort of glomming two courts together gives you more flexibility for how to use the courts as well. And I understand how this is sort of laid out sort of very organized this way, but I think it, it's better useful, it's more useful if the two courts are side by side. Um, three, I think that uh, what often happens in situations like this is that, you know, we have vehicles that the staff use and then they sort of park in the driveway where it says service entry and because there's no place else to put the vehicles, it would probably be wise for us to anticipate where to put, you know, a, a couple or three um, pickup trucks or whatever vehicles that we use on a regular basis that the service workers use to park um, 
either adjacent to the service entry where those little trees are or someplace in there that, oh, that's what that is for? Okay, that's good, you got that then. Yeah, that those are pull out for parking. And will people actually use them, you think? I mean, I would think that if I were going in and out a lot, I'd probably just want to pull up right where the service entry is, but. That's a good point. Um, and then the fourth thing is, I just I, I hope that you considered where to like where we're going to store snow when there is a snowstorm where it's going to get loaded um, after it's removed from the parking lots. Yeah, Paul. Um, related to the snow, we will have um, to work with conservation commission on where we can place the snow. So typically, what we would do is put signage, no snow removal here. You know put snow here, whatever, throughout the, throughout yeah, the site. I, but it, so. it, yeah, so it'd be good if it were designed so you know that the vehicles that have to move the snow can get there and get not there. damage anything on the path in the process. That's a good point. That's important. The, the, the engineers will, as part of their submission um, at some point and as part of their, their plan uh, for submission uh, before construction, will be preparing a snow plan for the property. Right. So that's part of the submission that we will be doing. Perfect, thank you. Sean. Thank you, Kathy. Um, so this design looks really great, but it, it does seem like a lot of site work. And I just, I think Kathy asked this last time, I wanted to double check um, that this level of site work is something that's already been included in our, and in sort of the baseline that we've been using for a cost estimate and that we're not gonna see when we do the next cost estimate, a huge jump in, in site cost. Um, Cause again, it looks great, but when you actually look at the sort of mass um, outside of the school, it's, um, you know, it's pretty large. Um, Tim, I don't know if you want yeah. to jump in. Yeah, I was gonna jump in on that. Um, the area and level of complexity are similar to what was costed at the PSR estimate. Um, and in, in some ways, it's a little bit simpler. Uh, the design now has water sheeting off of the hardscape play areas into the stormwater management features. Uh, much of what we were calling the Lazy River is now gone. I'm not saying that the site is less complex, but um, there has been no dramatic increase in scope or complexity that would increase the cost from when we were pricing it at PSR to now. Thank I think, you. yeah, I think, Sean, the only area that we've added and we don't, we'll find out what the cost is, is the play area, the kind of multi-purpose green play area between the two. Um, but it should be, it, it shouldn't be that increase the cost by much, right? And hopefully by simplifying the site design, um, there'll be a overall savings. Tammy. Hi. <laughs> I'm gonna lower my hand. Um, so I'll pull this down. Um, I guess just to consider that, and, and I think that this is, I know we're still sort of in the preliminary phases of this, but we will be housing at this new school an intensive learning center, which typically has students that are in wheelchairs and have mobility. So we would have to consider how this, these playgrounds will be boundless, right? Um, the other things I know about my students here at Fort Rivers, they love things like wall ball. And I would say at least 20% of my student body likes to play that. It's really interesting when I think about my K to twos, right? My uh, kindergarten through second graders, mostly they're using the swings and the playscape. And then as they age up, they're doing more fields, games, soccer, frisbee, wall ball, four square basketball, less using the playscape, but they still do. Um, so just, just to sort of be mindful of those things. And I do have a student principal advisory committee, so I will be bringing this to them. So Tammy, I think having, you know, the older kids involved and what they really are truly interested in will, will really help, um, make sure that the features that they will use uh, will be here. Wall ball might be, um, I don't know, I'm looking around to see what 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 wall surface they can play on. But um, that might we'll have to work on that. But I think if if you feel that the kids age up and really don't use the play equipment, then you know we can reduce the area for play equipment, which would be great because it reduces the cost. 
um, and, and focus on some other areas. And the only like comment I would say back is maybe a gag -a ball pit will, could potentially be something that would be similar to wall ball if there's something that we can't, but I'll bring it to them, but thank you. Yeah, Gaga, the Gaga pit's still a huge um, success. So, and, and as far as your accessibility, uh, everything will be accessible and not just accessible, but we wanna be really mindful when we select the play equipment that they can also interact and, and use the equipment. It's just, Tammy, I was just gonna ask on wall ball, when I was at Fort River, they were using the gym wall a lot, the outside wall of the gym a lot, right? So that's yep. one of the surfaces that's not available in this design, you know, when you look at it. So just mm -hmm. you know, thinking about, is there, yeah. Alternative, yeah, we'll, we'll get them fourth, fifth, and sixth graders on this. Paul's hand is up again. Yeah, so I just wonder if it would make sense for us. I mean, every inch of space here seems to be programmed. And would it be wise for us to say, let's not program everything because we're sort of making a decision in 2022 for the next 50 years. Maybe there's some space that we want to leave unprogrammed that some people's attitudes change and they want to do something different 10 years from now. And that could save us some money as well. Um, but I'm just wondering if it, you know, sort of unstructured space. We have a lot of nature trails and stuff like that, but immediately adjacent to the building, it's all seemed to be heavily programmed. So that's why I wonder if we get to consider that. Are there any other? I'm just looking, I don't see any other hands, but I might miss them. So shout out if I'm missing you. Okay, I think we're good. Okay, uh, just one more thing that I should mention while we're on the site plan, uh, before we move into the building, um, through discussions with Rupert, uh, we will be carrying a generator at grade um, in about this area. Um, putting it on the site rather than on the roof simplifies some things um, and gives you a bit more flexibility. Um, it's not shown on this plan, but the generator pad will, well, the generator itself is about 10 feet by 14 feet, potentially 8 to 10 feet tall, depending on the size of the tank. Um, and we could put a fence around it to screen it, but the location shown where my cursor is, um, is out of the field of vision as you approach from or directly the field of vision as you approach from either direction and sort of away from anywhere uh, play areas areas used by the site um, and it's convenient with the flow of utilities into the site um, you know as as we progress we will show you what it looks like uh, what the fence could be but putting it on the site rather than on a roof simplifies some things and gives the project a bit more flexibility going forward and I apologize, I wasn't, I don't think I was at the last meeting, but just to clarify, it's about a 600 kW diesel generator. So, um, to, so as not to use gas so that we can maintain the massive incentive of not utilizing gas on the site. Rupert. Yeah, just to add to that, I think, uh, uh, reserving rooftop space for PV makes a lot of sense, um, as does the um, larger oil tank capacity we have uh, if we're uh, ground mounted. I think there are a couple of good reasons for this decision. Jonathan? I, I, I like the idea of ground mounting the, the, the generator. Um, I do think we should uh, be considering um, you know, both fencing and, and possibly some acoustic screening from, from the adjacent properties, um, depending on, and maybe you can handle this all with the timing of when it runs, but you do have to, to run uh, generators from time to time to keep them going. Um, and diesel generators are, are, are not quiet or can often be noisy. Yep, yeah, absolutely. They are not quiet. There is uh, the potential there. It will be in a weather tight enclosure and that enclosure can have different sound ratings. And so as we, you know, get into the design, we will work that out and uh, make sure that it works with the proximity to the neighbors and the acceptable levels of noise. Um, do you, Tim, you, you, you said uh, to get the 
uh, energy incentive, we have to use diesel, not natural gas. Is there any chance over this next several months that restriction will be removed? No, uh, I don't think so, right, Kathy? This goes back to for the ground source heat pumps to receive that incentive. Yeah, no, I, I understand that. And I'm just that saying, therefore, diesel, which is noisier and smellier, you know, and you have to, it's, it's, it was a question that I don't need an answer right now, but it, it feels like an odd link to me that they've put what's, that in. What's the alternative? Well, well, the, the reason that we would be going with diesel is to avoid having a gas meter and therefore involving Berkshire gas in the project. If Berkshire gas is involved, if they have a meter on site, the incentive would come out of their pool of incentive money. Their pool of incentive money is much smaller than Eversource's pool. So it's, 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 not, it's not a real restriction. It's a choice that would allow to absorb or um, use all of that incentive money. If, if we had to go through Berkshire, there would be a limit on it. Paul, did, then, you, did you have a question on that too, Paul? No. Okay. And then uh, a diesel generator is loud. It does have to be exercised, but those are also true of a natural gas generator. Maybe not exactly decibel to decibel, but a, a natural gas generator has a large engine that is loud. Uh, the reason that it would be quieter as perceived from the neighbors is simply that it would be further away and on the roof. And then and then the other alternative from diesel and gas would be propane. And um, Tim, I don't recall. Uh, propane has a, a different set of issues. One, the tank would be larger. Um, it, it, and also uh, a propane uh, combustion engine has a inefficiency curve that is much less preferable. You'd be spending more for fuel and the generator to produce the same amount of power would have to be larger. So um, from just from an efficiency point of view, propane is probably not the way you want to go. Sean. I don't know enough about how this works, but I'm just curious in your in your thoughts. Um, would there be any room for possible battery storage in the future? I'm not sure how heavy it is or how much space it takes up, um, but with all the PV, um, I know a lot of places are adding battery storage. I'm just curious, uh, you know, if you've seen that anywhere and how much space it takes up. Um, so it's it's a related, but it doesn't solve the same issue as the generator if unless you have a, a very large probably larger amount of battery storage than you could fit on the site or would reasonably fit on the site batteries typically are used uh to take the peak off of the demand curve if you will rather than to run the building totally on its own in a power out situation um, technically it's possible but the battery array that would be required would be very large and expensive and uh I don't know that any schools have used battery backup for that purpose. Yeah, Tim, Tim, correct me if I'm wrong, though. I think what I was hearing, Kevin Murphy, who's our electrical engineer, he stated that um, PV and energy storage um, units have to be disconnected in a full power outage. I believe that's what he stated. So... That the, there are some intricacies to whether it's behind a meter and 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 yes and so if it's a it's a full battery backup system there there are some complications that would add complication and cost to the project to allow it to work because you know as what Don is saying there are code restrictions that if it's behind the meter that battery has to shut off with the building and then you have to essentially add equipment to turn it back on an automatic transfer switch so. Um, you know, for yeah. all of these reasons, I, I don't know that we're there yet to count on batteries as a backup for power for the system. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I, I have solar and the same thing that you have to, when power goes out, you have to, you can't use your solar, which kind of stinks. But I'm just curious if the town did want to, even if it wasn't for backup purposes, if the town just wanted to explore using battery storage on this site, because it's one of the newer buildings, it has a lot of PV. Um, how much space do you think would be required for, you know, for a you know, a meaningful amount of battery storage. 
uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Donna, but the pad for battery storage at Hastings is similar to the size for the generator. Correct. And the generator was is 500 uh, kilowatts at gas, but okay. so it would be about equal, Sean. Um, so what if if the town uh, desires even just to anticipate it in the future, which might not be a bad thing, right? Um, you know, the technology isn't one hundred percent there yet. These these storage systems are quite large, but maybe what we should do is double the pad size by the generator or or where we're putting the PV uh, transform. Yeah, I mean, I, it'd be, maybe the sustainability subcommittee can talk about it, but I, I do think there's going to be a lot of grants coming out for things like that. Okay. Um, and I know our, our sustainability coordinator is interested in it. So, but thank you for uh, answering the question. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think my only comment is that um, we would need to incorporate an area for the Conservation Commission so they see, right, Tim? Yeah, and, and I think this we should anticipate. There is an overall strategy of including some future ready features, be it conduit for EV charging that might be beyond what's initially included, even talking about conduit for the lights and the piping for the comfort station, I think including a pad and conduit to a battery uh, storage location, uh, if not the batteries themselves or the infrastructure themselves makes sense uh, that would allow you the flexibility in the future to add these without essentially digging up your site again to get them to work. Yeah, and it's also just um, having more pavement. And so when we go to Conservation Commission, it might behoove us to include that area so that in the future, if you do need or desire to put it in, if we don't do it now because of we're not sure where the locate the best location would be, that um, it's something that we should maybe consider when we submit our notice of intent. Jonathan. I guess I would just like to kind of second Sean's uh, idea that, that this is something that even if we Aren't, even if the technology isn't there to do it today, if there are reasonable and logical things to kind of prepare for, um, it, it does seem like something that over the next 10 or 15 years is likely to be an element that we will be adding to buildings. And so if, it, if there's a way to facilitate it uh, now, that would be great. Um. I think I'm going to move into the building right now. Uh, we do still have a bunch to talk about. Um, a lot of the plan updates um, that we've made in the past uh, week or two have um, been small and things like moving electrical closets and some toilets around to make sure that the infrastructure of the building works. Uh, the program spaces are uh, where you have seen them um, with some minor refinements. Um, you know, there has been a small change in the uh, service area. We, we've moved the MDF and some electrical closets around. Um, but uh, as a theme throughout the building, um, you will see that. Again, on the second floor, the academic space, the classrooms, the location of the library, art and STEM are all as you have seen. Uh, but we have some made some minor changes in terms of where the electrical closets are as we really get into making sure that the uh, building is coordinated and will work moving into the ST cost estimate. Um, and with that, I am going to start sharing some interior views that we can talk about. I just saw that Phoebe's here also. So Phoebe, could you just let us know whether you can hear and we can hear you. Hi there. Yes, yes, hi, thanks. <laughs> so this is a view that you have seen before. Um, it will coming in the front door through the secure vestibule, the opening to the main office space. Uh, many of the finishes and the composition of the interior elevations are the same. Um, uh, we have adjusted the roof height in this part of the building, the geometry of the clear stories. Um, 
I am pointing that out to say that we've done it to make the building work more efficiently and but it should not be noticeable from what you've seen um, and reacted to in the past. Um, there are some slight refinements to the finishes as we move in and look to the spaces that are open to the lobby, the gym to the right. And then we'll circle around the main stair from the lobby. One of the changes to the plan that you, I'm just gonna scroll back a little. Um, as we refine the plan, we're beginning to think about locations where we could potentially put art and wayfinding. Uh, in a previous iteration of this video on the plan, as you were looking down the hall, you would see the elevator window, or elevator door, I should say. Uh, now you were looking at a wall that could sponsor either a mural or art. Uh, there's just a placeholder here, but uh, circling around the gym again. Now we're looking into the cafeteria and out to the play space. Uh, here for the first time, we're looking into the gym, into the cafeteria, I should say. Uh, the ceiling here is rendered as a series of acoustic panels that are curved that make sort of a structural or a pattern in the ceiling with focus toward the stage. The ceiling in the high is higher in the center of the room, uh, more appropriate for a performance. It's lower as you look toward the lobby to the left and out to the play space on the right. This shows the ceiling panels all as one color, not to distract from what's on the stage, but it's also possible to bring the color patterns, the color way that we saw in the acoustic panels into for, that we saw in the lobby and bring them into the cafeteria. So you might have a more lively expression on the ceiling here. Um, and, you know, as we get into the designs, that's something we can talk about the use of color, whether it's a, a feature itself or a, a background for what is happening on the stage. Because, uh, you know, most of the time when kids are in this room, there isn't going to be a performance on the stage. Here we are moving upstairs into one of the main parts of the building, the project areas outside of the classrooms. So here we are walking down the hall, looking to the east, and you can see light, uh, basically floor to ceiling glass at the end of the corridor. Here we're going in seeing student storage and storage for teachers above and the door to each of the classrooms. Um, in each cluster of three classrooms, there is a one classroom that is most of the exterior wall of the project areas. And we've shown clear story glass above that and into both the second and third classrooms on both sides so that light from the exterior of the building through that transom, through the large side lights at the side of the door, will be able to get into the project areas. Um, you know, most kids and teachers will not be able to see directly through that. Um, but it will allow light, it'll give you a bright ceiling. Um, you'll notice there's some ceiling clouds shown, but we've shown them sort of um, woven um, out of pieces, not solid to allow the most of the daylight through into the spaces and then some sculptural and com colorful light fixtures. Hey, Tim. Um, I, if you wanna just talk about the lockers, Tim. Yep, so as shown here, um, there are 72 lockers, um, enough, uh, and they're all on the perimeter wall. Uh, the center mill work, each one, that would be one per student, 15 by 15 inches wide, two feet tall. And then above those lockers, one per student, we have cabinets that could be storage for uh, the teachers and other academic things. And so with the lockers all on the perimeter wall, um, there's room for this mill work that separates the space of the project areas. Um, you can, this is shown with whiteboard and tack board and some seating areas and some storage and uh, potentially a place for a child to sit alone and read um, as we go through and really develop this space, we can talk about the best use. It is possible to take some of these lockers and move them to the millwork in the center if 
we thought that was appropriate and allow for some whiteboard space that's a little bit further from the circulation of the corridor. But overall, with this millwork defining the space, um, and as you look down the corridor, you'll be able to see the edge of these clouds as a wayfinding technique. And then this is a blue and green palette. Um, that is not to say that there couldn't be a specific palette to each grade, to each floor. Um, all of that has to be decided as we move forward with the design. Can, can you explain the cloud concept? I'm not sure people will necessarily understand what you're talking about. So these elements are uh, with a ceiling structure, uh, either aluminum trim or ceiling grid with panels in um, and lighting, um, and they bring the ceiling down to a level uh, that may be a bit more appropriate for the project area. They can sponsor lighting. And as you go down the hall, you can see them, uh, you know, from a bit further away. And if they are color scoded, they will allow you to, um, you know, see what's coming next. But it, it is a, a simply an element that defines the space through changing the ceiling plane. Um, that the lighting, the colors will inform the design. Then here we show more tax surface on the exterior so that we can display student work. Kathy, you have a question? Yeah, you talked about color schemes and one of the schools we visited, the floor had a stripe in it that if you were going to the blue room, you followed your blue stripe. I mean, I think Paul, you had mentioned some kind of way fan. Um, so the floor is a nice neutral color right here, but that Th would that also be a choice if you wanted to have um yeah okay so yes. it's just it was just a question you know you're you're on your way to the blue wing or the red mm -hmm. wing or the orange or the i don't know the green wing yeah okay absolutely i mean if, if you remember hastings where the uh floors uh told you what uh, the color palette told you where you were uh that extended to the flooring itself i mean here we are just showing it neutral so that we can focus on some of the elements that we have designed already but absolutely um wayfinding um and many other elements can be expressed through the flooring um, so uh this is taken uh granted at we'll call it my eye level um, so you'll just see the hint of um, windows above the transom uh, to the outdoor. The ceilings are 10 feet, um, and then at the perimeter of the classrooms, uh, 12 feet, so quite high, which will allow light to get pretty deep into the space. Nope, we've moved on from the project areas. Um, if anyone has any comments from the project areas, we can talk about that, but then we're going to move into, as I imagine you could guess, the library. We'll keep moving. So this is the view as you exit the corridor and step into the library. Um, you know, this is sort of a first pass for, at an organization of bookshelves and learning spaces in the classroom, but you are looking at the curtain wall to the north that you have been seeing from the exterior for quite some time. Um, there are, are spherical and rain lights uh, to sort of give some life to a, a fairly a simple but you think elegant ceiling plane. And then as you move into the space, we currently are showing a, a space for a classroom size learning or a, a, with movable tables and um, classroom technology. Uh, that is not to say that this might not want to be somewhere else in the library. Um, here we're pausing to look at um, above the stacks, there are a good amount of space that could sponsor artwork, murals, um, graphics. Um, it's another entire design element to see what would be best to see on the walls to um, uh, you know, make this library yours. And then as we sort of circle around. This is a storytelling area uh, with 
the stacks moved to the side and the storytelling area itself defined by furniture. And then here we're looking into the librarian's book room, which is enclosed um, and the circulation desk. And then here we are looking at the entrance of the library from the inside with the door to the corridor. Um, this is imagined with uh, mostly glass wall. And then you can see across to the stair that connects directly below to the lobby. Uh, Rupert, you have a question? Yeah, just a quick question. Um, just to give me a sense of scale, I should probably have this in my head, but uh, the higher ceiling is that between floor and finished ceiling, is that like 12 or 14 feet? Uh, it's a considerably higher than that at the very, uh, you're looking at 17 feet at that point right here. So there, there's a good amount of volume here in the library. And then as you circle around, back to um, the entrance here in the range of 10 or maybe a little bit below. So it, it is a comfortable area. It will be a very well lit library media center. Um, I, th I think what's also important is just to note that with the exception of the built-in um, bookshelves along the perimeter, everything in the classroom is flexible. So all of the stacks in the middle of the room, the teaching area, the seating area, the storytelling area um, are, are all movable. And obviously you're not gonna move the stacks in between classes or whatever, maybe you know over a summer, if you decide you want to, to move them around for whatever reason, that's certainly possible. And then so, I should- Rupert, Tim, I'm sorry to interrupt. So mm -hmm. Rupert, um, you know, I'm I'm looking at this and thinking about your comment and thinking that you have a building with relatively low ceilings now. So, you know, an issue with a space like this is relamping lights and ceiling access. Is that where your question is coming from? Yeah, Do you want to just ask, be more specific about what you're asking? <laughs> Um, well, I can see that you've got uh, uh, looks like uh, pendant globe lights uh, that will be a little bit more accessible, but I am trying to imagine getting in there with a, a, a lift just to change a light bulb. Um, all of the lights will be LEDs. I know you've heard that LEDs never need to be changed, but obviously they do need to be changed sometimes. Uh, but um, the, as Donna said, uh, these acts in the center of the room will be movable. Um, and it, I'm not going to say it's going to be easy to change, but it won't be any harder than anything else. And it will be possible. And, and Rupert, um, to that point, as part of the F and E uh, furniture and equipment, um, you know, we're, we're going to want to work with you on what kind of maintenance equipment you may need again. Um, in here, in the gym, wherever they're really high ceilings, you know, ideally the LEDs don't have to be changed, but but every 10 years or whatever. But um, if you want to start thinking about if a lift does make sense for this building, then, then we can um, incorporate that into the budget. Thank you. Um, I just, as another comment while we're on the subject, I'm delighted to see there's no recessed lights way up at ceiling height uh, in the high ceiling area. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah, and Rupert, Donna's correct. There is a, there is a, a, a piece of the budget that's embedded in this that we haven't talked about it at all, which is the equipment you're going to need to maintain the building. So that, that does come as part of the overall project cost. Uh, one more thing I should mention. Um, so we're talking about ceiling height. Since we have that higher um, ceiling height in the cafeteria below, there will be a couple steps. It'll be right now it's one foot four above the rest of the second floor. There will be two ways to get into the library. One will be a ramp and one will be uh, a few risers. Um, and we're working on the best way to make it as seamless as possible. Um, and Jim, and the, those that that access is it a function of having pulled the overall floor to floor height down in order to reduce yes. the overall volume of the building so that's Correct. you mm -hmm. had mentioned that at a previous meeting but just to reiterate yep. uh, 
just as another comment, um, uh, another reason why we will probably be looking at a lift for the ceiling is not just changing LEDs, but uh, smoke detectors and uh, sprinkler systems and so forth. It is not uncommon that a lift be purchased as part of the FME package. There are there are going to be spaces that uh, they're high. Paul, and then, quick question: We don't use ceiling fans or anything like that in a situation to circulate air, right? Okay. No. So just um, just st you don't need to go back to the library, but when you were talking about input from teachers and the use of space, um, you said all of these central bookcases can be moved around. And I think the ones I saw at the Lexington School weren't as long as these. Maybe they're exactly the same. These look heavy. So I'm just and then the tables and the chairs. So it's all of this, you're getting input from the teacher. I, I'm not saying that I have any idea what to do with this, but getting some input from teachers and Tammy was along on the trip to see some of the choices, but it felt like there was a huge amount of choices of the kind of chairs that were in the library, the kind of tables that were in the library, um, this, the sheer length of the bookcases, uh, in terms of I could move a few of them and so without help. So that was like, boy, I could overnight if I wanted to recreate a space, I could do it. So I'm just, it's more on how you get input on things that don't need to be, you don't need to have a hard decision on them right now, but just a sense, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and thank you, Kathy. I mean, these, these are just representations. Um, we wanted to carry a, a volume count per se, but but we can get into it. And yes, these are shown as um, one large um, kind of bookshelf unit, but but in actuality, we probably would do it in half. Yeah, it would be too, okay, at least. Thanks. You're all very observant with the details. <laughs> <laughs> and and then if there are no more comments, questions, uh, thoughts on the inside, we are going to just, oh, Allison. Allison has her hand up. Hi, I just was wondering, I know that there's all these beautiful windows in the cafeteria. Uh, do those open? Are they sliding doors? To... The cafeteria will have doors, but the glass itself is not operable. Okay. Go back to the cafeteria. Okay. In the classrooms, there will be operable doors, certainly, uh, but for the sake of operable energy, windows. Yes. So, and Allison, yeah, what we envisioned was that there is ample seating on the outside uh, so, so that you can have outdoor dining, but we have that one exterior door, Tim, leading to the outside, and yes. it's a vestibule, right? So. Mm -hmm. I only was asking because one of our concerns during COVID has always been um, ventilation. I know this building has better ventilation and uh, we are very sensitive to the idea that when children are eating that the, there needs to be better airflow. So then that's the only reason I'm bringing it up, but I'm sure the airflow in this building will match whatever is needed to make sure we're responsive to pandemic needs. Um, I'm going to um, sip ahead and go. Uh, just a quick tour around the outside of the building um, to show um, any changes that have been made and as we're adjusting the plan. And uh, for the most part, there have not been many. Um, and, and to the, to the extent that there are, there were not really noticeable. We have adjusted, as Margaret mentioned, um, the floor to floor height. We've adjusted the roof height in the library a little bit, all of which in the interest of making the volume that has to be heated and cooled uh, lower uh, and make the building therefore more efficient. Um, 
the north elevation is essentially the same as the last time you saw it. Um, circling around to the east side, you can see that we have a good amount of glass at the end of the corridors and unobstructed view that will allow people circulating through the building to see out to get daylight in. Moving around to the south side of the building, you can see the external sunshades on the classroom windows. We are still working on the canopy at the bus entrance. Um, the geometry of the building has made that a little bit deeper, and so we're probably going to be changing that. Um, we are still working on the service area and the best way to screen it and to organize it. Tim, can you talk about what the light and dark, the dark I'm assuming is an effort to render the manganese iron spot? That, that, yeah, that this is a little bit washed out. The dark is the manganese iron spot brick. Um, the light is um, the lighter masonry materials that we have been showing. Um, and then uh, some of the other materials here, um, we have not decided what the canopy will be the this is a an equipment screen which will probably be a single skin metal panel um and then curtain wall and accent panels of masonry around the openings there have not been many um a lot of the work has been focused on the interior but we just wanted to show uh for this very observant group that a few things have changed and with that uh, if there are any questions, we're going to switch over to the energy model and Ali. All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Let me share, share screen. Perfect. I'm going to share screen two and hopefully this works and I'm going to put it on presentation mode so that all the messages from my team members don't pop up every so often. It's an active week for those of us who are around. Okay, so we go here. We go. All right, you should be seeing the full version and not the presenter view. Can you confirm that? Mm -hmm. All right, great. So this is an update on uh, the energy analysis for the building. Uh, the key goals of the study were to perform the energy analysis, estimate energy use, and then get a sense of where we were uh, lead points wise, um, besides all the other. All the other things we think about when we're looking at energy, what has changed, I have an extra bullet point there, blank, but not meant to be there. What has changed from the last time you saw it? The zones, basically the model has been redone um, because the massing changed. Uh, the zones have been refined. The earlier model we had was very rough. Uh, it's a type of models that we do really early in the design where we're looking at zones just very roughly, like these are gonna be roughly classrooms. These are gonna be roughly offices, but it's really rough. Um, so what we have done this time around is we've gone, you know, classroom by classroom, office by office, corridor by corridor, drawing everything. And so it's, it, I would say it's brand new model. Uh, the schedules have also been refined. And so we had a conversation on this is in particular, um, the summer use um, and got guidance uh, in terms of the fact that the building is anticipated or that we would like the model, the building to be modeled as two thirds occupied. Um, just to make sure we're accounting for all anticipated use, because as a reminder, we want to know the reason why we want to know the EUI has to do with, you know, not only leap points, but also the utility incentives uh, are dependent on that. Uh, the size of the PV array depends on that. And so having a, a good sense of what we, the real, you know, anticipating the real occupancy of the building on a busy building is important. Um, the window to wall ratio, we're still at 22% uh, glazing. Uh, there are certain glazing areas that are that are well-defined already. And for the others, we were asked to just match it to make sure we're 22. And so there's still, you know, we'll still need to be reconciling as the design moves along just to make sure that the design is on track uh, to meeting the 22, but we're confident 
uh, the DNSCO team will be, you know, is tracking that as well. And so 22%, um, so nothing has changed there, you know, the amount of glass and where it was, you know, has changed a little bit went from the past design. But as I mentioned, this is a brand new model in reality. Um, and so without more, uh, we can talk about envelope. No, nothing has changed from the envelope assumptions from the last time around. And we can talk about the assumptions in detail, but I just wanted to give you just a sense of where we are. Um, our lead baseline has an EUI 46. For those of you who are familiar with the lead baseline, the only reason why we look at the lead baseline is for lead points, but it's not a representative building in any way, shape or form. Uh, the proposed building as it is, uh, is it an EUI of 25? Um, and uh, we looked at what would be the impact of incorporating high performance glass. We've been talking about a glazing system that performs like triple pane glass, but that is more affordable than triple pane glass that is used in many schools and that is actually really successful. And so we wanted to just get a sense of where that would get us and more will come as we dig a little deeper into that. Um, a couple of things, I think the most important thing to point out, and so I've added there also the size of the PVRA that would correspond um, to this e EUI. Um, there's a note that I do want to point you uh, to in that this is, we consider this a conservative uh, estimate because we, the next step uh, will be to make sure that the occupancy we're using, we're looking at the schedules and taking, you know, default occupancies for a typical classroom, et cetera, et cetera. But what we have found is that, and we typically do this as we move into DD, that the people count is really important. Uh, and so making sure that we're not, you know, at lunchtime, this is the most typical, but at lunchtime, oftentimes a default schedule and energy model will be counting people in a classroom and in the cafeteria at the same time. And so we have to yet yeah, go through that people count at every hour just to make sure that we suddenly don't have twice as many students at lunchtime. Um, and um, I'm exaggerating, but that refinement will typically um, the EUI will go down with that refinement. And so we definitely consider this to be a conservative estimate. Um, other inputs that need to be refined are elevator energy, exterior lighting, um, occupant count, as I mentioned, and then lighting per space. Right now we're taking um, uh, an average uh, watts per square foot as recommended by the electrical engineer, but we'll definitely want to refine that a little bit. Um, Maybe I should have just stepped back and paused a little bit on the proposed and just point out that this is a really efficient building. Um, how does one know typically in really efficient buildings, the equipment, uh, so can you see my mouse? I don't know if you can see my mouse, but uh, the, um, the equipment takes up a bit, you know, a good third of what the energy is in the building. That means that a lot of you know, equipment and lighting are, you know, are the bigger loads. Uh, and then everything else, you know, thanks to the ground source heat pump and all the other things, then all the other. So these, this is energy we need. The lighting and the equipment is energy we need by program. And so what we try to do with a really energy efficient building is try to minimize any other energy we need to condition that space. So of course there's pump energy and fan energy to ventilate, but uh, this is definitely the profile of a really energy efficient building. Um, a last slide that I'll show. Oh, it's not there. Hmm. Sorry, I will try to pull it up for some reason. I'm missing that slide. I had some issues uh, saving and versioning yesterday. And so it's missing right there, but we had um, a true. Oh, I'm sorry to I'll interrupt. Tell you. Yes, Vivian, Jonathan, go ahead. Jonathan has his hand up. I just wanted to make sure you. Yes, perfect. That. Jonathan, I'll just get to you because I'm. Leaving on the like, I'm missing a slide. I'll just tell you, we have the utility, the annual utility costs for each one of those in case there were questions about, well, how much are we saving with a high performance glass? We actually have that number, but my slide disappeared. And so I'm happy to dig that up if it's of interest right now. Otherwise it will be sent within the deck uh, afterwards. Jonathan. So my question just touches on the glass. Um, right now in the proposed, uh, in the proposed uh, energy model, not the proposed with high performance glass yeah. and also in our cost estimate. What what are we carrying? Are we carrying dual glazed or triple glazed? It's dual. Just as a reminder. It's what was double that? Pain. It's double, double pane. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. 
Kathy? Um, it, with um, user controls of the building use um, in terms of energy, do you have incorporated into this uh, places that people could see how much this area the building is using, how much is that, I don't know what kinds of monitors, you know, I'm not articulating it well, but rather than just one, um, being able to, to look at uh, upper floor, lower floor. Yeah. You know, that if if we wanted to have the teachers, others say, how how'd we do today? How we do over the last four months or the kids look at monitors, would there be places uh, that, uh, other than high tech people, uh, people, the users could be looking mm -hmm. at. So I'm going to defer to Danisco, but just to clarify, so you're talking about sub metering, uh, the energy model itself does not take that into account. That doesn't impact what the predicted energy use is, uh, but how you actually understand how the energy is, is, um, is going to the different places would be done by sub metering in uh, Tim and team. Um, uh, I'll defer to you on 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 the conversations and sub metering on how far we've gone into that discussion. Uh, we we have not designed a building management system or the software that will be included with the project that would allow this sort of monitoring. But it has been mentioned in the past. There are certainly uh, an opportunity and uh, a desire. I, I I think as we develop the design with VAVR mechanical, we will incorporate that uh, you know to to what degree and how many locations uh we don't know yet but uh, i know that has been expressed and it's something we're thinking about yeah but i i think what kathy maybe um correct me if i'm wrong kathy is displays throughout the building so that it can also be used as a teaching tool right it's um, it's, it's both that it yeah. would be metering so rupert ben custodians could be managing it but also uh, teachers and students could be learning from it you know it, it, be, it could be learning from it and it wouldn't have to be every single one i see both paul and rupert have their hands up so yeah kathy and, just, really just, just to build on that kathy um i think that's one of our brands for this building is a net zero and that i think you know umass's um physical fitness um, building has that they have a big screen when you walk in it shows you how much energy has been used and history and stuff so I think if we can incorporate a screen of some sort like that in terms of how we brand this building, that's one of the things we really want to promote. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, and I wasn't talking about everywhere. You know, it is uh, it is the one North Virginia one I saw, there was one place you could go and go, whoa, look at today. Um, so uh, thank you. Uh, Rupert. Yeah, I just wanted to echo uh, what uh, Donna had already said. Uh, we sort of had preliminary discussions between uh, Denisco and uh, their uh, uh, VAB International, their mechanical engineer, uh, and myself, and we're looking forward to following up on that. I think um, uh, part of the discussion will involve what's uh, what level of detail is useful and meaningful uh, for uh, learning purposes, and what level of detail is important for building management purposes. And they're two separate discussions, really, um, which I'm looking forward to. Any, any other comments? Sorry to just jump in, but. That's good. I'll just add that, that this is particularly important when you have an all electric building. Um, you know, in, in the past, we at least could look at heating and, you know, gas as a separate thing is electric, but now everything will be electric, right? And so understanding of the electric, what is going to the ground source heat pump versus what's going to your plug loads, right? What can you control versus what kind of depends on the climate is uh, in outdoor conditions is, is important, right? So measuring, but thinking about what, what use will we give to that data and how can we get data that we can that we can take an action on, right? So that that relates so data that relates to usage in particular and that can influence how we use the building should be separate from data that is just, you know, it is what it is for the climate. Paul, is your hand still up or is that from before? Okay. Thank you.
right? So um, if, if if there's not another question, I just see that you've got proposed high performance glass. Oh, sorry. That hasn't been priced in yet. So that's a that's a maybe. Is that where that's sitting? Okay. That is a maybe that we will be looking at when we um, submit documents to the cost estimator in December. Any other questions or comments? And uh, Tim, is does that? That concludes our presentation for today. So I, I do ask, you know, it's a re repeated request, but please send this set, including the rotating videos. Um, I've got at least one district meeting I'm gonna try to do. And so some of these refinements are, Terrific, and they're exciting. Um, any any other? Um, I don't know whether we have invoices for today. Um, Sean, Margaret, we do. Margaret, do you want to bring them up, or do you want me to? Yeah. So I we have uh, just the answer invoice for today. Um, let me just open that up. Okay, it's opening. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, so this is our October invoice, which just went out a couple days ago. Uh, it's for 64.55, which, uh, and it also includes the cost of our estimate, the PSR. Oh, sorry, can everybody see it? Just realized I may not have shared. Yeah. Okay. So it, our fees um, for this period is sixty four fifty five, and then there's fifty five hundred dollars for uh, the preferred schematic report estimate um, by our estimator Peter Bradley. And as always, um, this sort of has really mostly my hourly billing. Um, a little bit of work by Bob Stevens on uh, administrative activities. And there's PM and C's invoice. So that is it. Do I hear a motion? I'll make a motion to <laughs> accept. Uh, Second. Um, and I need to do a roll call vote. Uh, Rupert? Rupert, yes. Ben? Ben, yes. Phoebe? Yes. Paul? Yes. Jonathan? Yes. Mike? Yes. Tammy? Yes. John? Yes. Simone? Yes. And Alicia? Yes. So Margaret, when you do the tally, you'll have to count the people. Allison had to leave early. Um, okay. Okay. So, you know, one thing I, I, I think I've been told is on the total amount we have budgeted for answer, there's an overall monitoring of it so that we're, we'll be fine up until the next stage of the project. Is that correct? Well, that's true for both contracts. So both contracts go through the submission of the um, schematic design, and then there's some time set aside for helping get you to the vote. But once we hit the vote, now, one thing that does need to happen is that we need to negotiate and agree upon fees for the remainder of the project because they get included in the um, overall project budget. So that piece um, is going to happen in the next month or so. Okay. So be before I open it up for public comments, I, um, I sent it to people over the weekend because I just learned about it on Friday, but the school committee last week, Mike, Ben, um, voted on a motion to support the CPA proposal for the fields, just the field proportion of it. Is, is that correct? Okay, and I, I sent people that um, our committee actually has, as a building committee, has no 
those are school properties. So I didn't know whether anyone wanted to express support. I will be attending that meeting. I am a liaison to CPA anyway, but I'm in an awkward position because I'm a counselor and then I get to vote on the CPA budget. So I have to, I have to be relatively well, I can be a citizen, I can be a resident. So um, I just wanted to make sure everyone was aware because the group that presented to us asked if we wanted to take a vote. And um, I thought it was more important that the school committee does because they have to, those will be athletic fields if CPO money is awarded. So that it's kind of late breaking news, but I didn't know whether people wanted to take any action here or not. I'm not seeing any. So Kathy, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, what would the best way, whether it's as a, you know, as a committee or individually that we would show support for that? Um, I think if, number one, it's on, I will send everyone the exact dates and time because CPA schedules um, it. And I think in public comments, we'll hear that. You can come on as a resident and express your support. You know, I think the big one for us is it reduces the taxpayer ask for, for the rest of the project budget. Um, and so this is an integral part of the project. So you can come on as individuals, you can come on as people from the committee. I'm just saying that I'm in a, a position where as a council member, I'm also gonna be voting on the CPA budget. So I have to, I have to be, cautious on uh, what I say. I'm, I'm clearly, um, everyone in the Sean finance world is trying to figure out the best way of packaging the financing of the school to keep the, you know, the news on the energy budget that we get that big incentive, you know, are there going to be grants for PV? So we're looking at the whole package, but so, but that you, everyone can come on with comments and you can send in written comments. There, there's, the CPA takes written comments as well. And Kathy, there there's a, and just to, there's a um, public hearing for CPA on December 8th. Um, that's after all the presentations are done. And that's sort of the specific time for community members or residents to come and voice support for any of the CPA projects. And they do the, the way they work is they they they've got an ask that's much bigger than the amount of money this year. So what they do is they're talking within themselves on higher priority and making judgment calls about amounts, not just is the project in or but they don't have to accept it at the full amount if a project can take less. Jonathan, want to make sure I understand from the fact that I sit on this group, are there, is there a protocol about putting that, you know, putting forward support or comment uh, for something? Um, how, how, how does a member of this committee express that properly? Or, is it, I mean, or, or can Paul, we just be Paul, citizens can, at that point? <laughs> Paul, Paul, you can comment on that. You know, what I, what I've seen on other projects, not this one, I've seen people from the historical commission come in and weigh on a historical project. You know, even though it was, you know, it wasn't their project. So I, we're we we're just we're a different kind of entity here. You know, we're a public building, we're a school, we're, and we're residents. Paul, I don't know. Yeah. What. So so I think you don't give up your right to be able to have a public comment. So you can always go to the CPA public hearing and make whatever comment you want as an individual. But you can't say, um, I'm speaking for the elementary school building committee because the committee hasn't taken a position on it and um, probably be unwise for the committee to take a position position on it at this point in time. Phoebe, is your hand still up? I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah. No, no, I just had another question. Um, and, you know, maybe given what you just said, Paul, I'm, I guess my question, which maybe should be answered offline, I'm not sure, is is there a reason why we wouldn't, as a committee, make a public statement? It seems to me that it would be in the best interest because, it, you know, overall funding of this is, you know, something that we talk a lot about. And if there's a benefit 
I don't know. That makes sense. <laughs> yep. It's it's a clear question. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, the committee can do what, what it wants, but I think in the context of what the CPA is looking at, um, this is more of a finance question, like where does the money come from? This is all taxpayer money. It's not free money or anything like that. It's all taxpayer money. So a matter of, uh, in terms of assembling a package of financing this project um, is, you know, I think we're putting together energy credits and all kinds of different things um, saying we really want this one source of revenue um, when there are so many other needs in town, I can't really take a position on it because um, I would uh, not want to because of all the other demands that are coming from other departments in, uh, in, the, in the town. And I, I think that Sean and Mike might be in a similar position. Alicia? Um, thank you. So I, I understand what Paul is saying, but I also just wanted to speak in support of um, what Phoebe was mentioning in that I think there is some benefit in us at least making a statement that we support the initiative or the idea around that, because I do think it would really benefit us in the uh, debt exclusion override if this were a successful endeavor. Um, and so I think that it would be wise for us to support such thing um, in terms of making sure that this is passable and just other extra efforts that we can put forth as a committee to ensure the success of the project. Um, so I'm not sure if there's another appropriate way or another way that the committee might feel would be more appropriate, but I personally think um, it might be wise just saying we support this initiative, whether it be approved or not, I think we should say that we support this moving forward or make that clear to the CPA if that is possible so that they know that when they're making their decision that this would also benefit us as a committee. Um, let me, I'll just try to summarize what I'm hearing. Um, I think we're hearing Alicia and Phoebe that some people would need to abstain, wouldn't be opposed, but not take a position. But each one of us can go in separately and be supportive for the debt exclusion, reducing, it is a, a tax package. Um, so I don't, and that the school committee, I think was the critical group because they had to actually, CPA will put, um, if that money gets awarded, those are, recreational fields forever. They don't become usable in other ways. So that was an extremely important vote. So I'm, I'm, I'm loath to take a vote if we're not unanimous, if we really end up losing people. And we have nine people left right now. Um, Tammy had to leave and Allison's not here and Angelica's not here. You know, I, I, maybe I'm miscounting. So I mean, it's, it's, it's clearly up to the committee. Um, yeah, I don't, I think it's not on the agenda. So I'm not yeah. sure if we can vote today anyway, even if we wanted to, you could put it on a future agenda for the council, for the committee to, to vote on. Okay, so if the hearing is on the seventh, we have another meeting on the second. So that's what I think people will come back and we can, we can revisit this. And if, I, if I said the seventh, it's on the eighth. Sorry, if I said the, the seventh. Okay, no, I, I misspoke. You did say the eighth, Sean. So we will be meeting before that happens. Alicia? Is your hand up again or is it still up? Yeah, sorry. I would just be interested. I'm, I don't want to like force or be um, asking people to talk, but I'd be interested to hear how the other committee members feel about this, if they would be interested in taking a vote or if other people would prefer that we individually go forward. Mike. Uh, I'm not gonna help much, but to break the sounds, I don't have a strong preference either way. I, I have no opposition you know, to either method, I'll have my opinions about, you know, the actual question, but in terms of process, um, I, I don't have a strong preference either way. And 
I will put it on the next agenda. Um, I I have forgot to do this, Paul, but I didn't know whether the school committee was going to take a vote on it. I had heard that they wouldn't be able to meet, and I was out of town, so it's so I only learned that they had actually discussed and made a motion, and then Allison did send me the wording that she sent a direct letter over. Um, so I can put it on the agenda for the next meeting if people would like. Phoebe? So to clarify, because I am not um, uh, completely clear on the procedure, if we wanted to take a vote next meeting because we can't this meeting, would we make a motion this meeting to support or would we make that motion at the next meeting? What is the procedure? here so that I'm clear on at, at the next meeting and I will I will put discussion and motion on the agenda okay, okay. and then we can decide next okay. and we will have time so I think that's it I'm sorry to make this awkward because I I feel as, as a I, I'm in a triple spot because I'm also the lead council liaison to CPA <laughs> so I'm on the finance I have I'm, I've got too many hats on for this question. So are there any other um, uh, uh, questions or comments before I turn it op open it up? Jonathan. It, it, this is not on our, our last conversation. I, I really like the idea of putting on the next uh, time's agenda, but I just wanted to kind of make a general comment, which is to thank the design team for all their efforts on the 3D visualizations. I know the effort that goes into making those uh, <laughs> videos, both interior and exterior. I think they're wonderful tools for uh, communicating the progress. And there's been a lot of great progress on the project. Um, and they're really helpful with, with the, I think the broader community. And I love the fact that some of them are taken, you know, or at least start off at, at kid height, which I think is, is, is very important to kind of see the building from, from the, the, the the largest population group will be using it. So I just want to say thank you. So I want to echo that because the other thing you did with the picture of the outdoors, one person said there were no trees, Tim. And your original rotating around had so many trees you couldn't see the building. And I kept saying the trees are there, not to worry. <laughs> so it's not a site. Sorry, without... we, we have to do that. No, I, I said every week. Can't. So you, you can't. <laughs> Okay, so I think we are open for public comments at this point. And I see uh, two people's hands are up and I am not host. So I think Sean has been promoted as host. So- Yeah, I make Sean host because I, I, I have to start a different meeting. Okay, so- yeah, I brought Bruce in. Okay, thank you. So Bruce, you have joined us. Yes, thank you. I echo what Jonathan said. Uh, absolutely. Um, a couple of uh, one question and, uh, uh, and and I guess a question comment. The first is um, Tim, uh, the uh, or maybe it's Alejandro, the uh, uh, the the upgrade, the potential or the consideration of the upgrade to a triple glazing with a lower U value and so forth. I remember in the basis of design for the uh, PSR, I think. Um, there was mention of supplementary heating in certain places. Uh, and I think it was, uh, in some cases, it was near uh, windows uh, in, in, in areas of sedentary activity. And I'm thinking that if that's the case, then uh, upgrading uh, those windows or some of those windows, I guess it's the large areas of windows you might be contemplating to a higher performance glazing, presumably would enable the um, the supplementary heating in those areas to be eliminated, uh, which would save a little bit of energy, of course, uh, and and also a little bit of cost. So if, if that's the case, I'm assuming that uh, the upgrade to a high performance grazing uh, might or would include the uh, elimination of some uh, uh, spot heating. Um, don't answer that, of course, but uh, it may have be I may have misunderstood. Second, um, in in uh, respect of the uh, the the, the uh, energy use uh, chart. Um, I'm becoming quite interested in the uh, in the plug loads, uh, which I guess in that chart is largely the equipment. So uh, 
I just think uh, I'll, I'll, I, it's become a, it's increasingly apparent to me that that the uh, management of that uh, fraction of the plug load or equipment, which is essentially the user or occupant uh, responsibility to uh, achieve budgetary energy budgetary objectives, is not going to be the responsibility of the design team. Um, the design team seem to have responsibility for. And, and along with the constructors for getting us through maybe 70, uh, maybe two thirds of that. But the other third uh, in these charts seems to be occupant uh, use. And, uh, and when I was an architect, I had a passing interest in that, but I'm realizing that I didn't really have a really thorough understanding of how to go about managing this. So I'm getting quite interested in how uh, this, uh, project uh, and who in this project takes responsibility and how responsibility is taken for uh, meeting these uh, occupant load energy budgets. So I'm, some questions I guess I will have in the future for that. But for example, I imagine that the elevator slash process, that process doesn't include uh, cooking and kitchen loads. If it does, it's very efficient. Um, but so I, I would appreciate the, uh, as, as this model is refined to um, break out some of those loads like cooking, which are essentially things that can be tracked in the, in the building uh, that don't become so much a, an occupant load. I mean, they are, I guess, the people who are running the kitchen, but not the occupants of the building generally, whereas other loads really are going to be down to occupant behavior. And, and I'm getting particularly interested in those. So I'll be asking questions in the future to build that interest and, and hopefully be constructive in helping the project to understand and manage them. That's it for me. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank Bye. you, Bruce. And, and Rudy, we have brought you in. I think, thanks very much. Oops, let me get my camera on here. Uh, I just want to echo what uh, Bruce Bruce's concern about the plug load and to make sure that we're looking at energy savings and all the equipment, the kitchen is, you know, and the coolers and walk-in uh, freezers and refrigerators, all of the kitchen equipment is going to be um, something that I suspect is going to be specced by as part of the project itself. Anything that's getting specced within the cost estimates, I think we should be looking carefully at to see if there's um, you know, more energy efficient versions at a same or similar price point, and that we go through the plug loads with the same kind of care that you all have taken about the building envelope and glazing and so forth. And um, I realize some of that's probably being brought over from the old schools, but to the extent it's not, we should also maybe have school people looking, making sure they're getting the most efficient printers, uh, computer screens, uh, projectors, all that kind of thing to help us with our EUI. So I agree with Bruce. We need to have a better understanding of where that responsibility breaks out and how much is within this committees and what, um, what can be done to improve that equipment number. And secondly, on the, the vote on the CPA, obviously I have a somewhat vested interest here as one of the proponents of it. But I think it would be really um, important for the SBC to take uh, some kind of position on this as a group, at the least to clarify that this is not in conflict with the, um, the planning and uh, purposes uh, that the school building committee itself is, is undertaking. I mean, I, if I were the CPA, I'd, I'd want to know that this proposal or certain elements of it were uh, consonant with, I don't know what the right word is, harmonious with uh, what the school building committee sees as the trajectory of this project and the um, need to get the public on board. And uh, obviously, I think it would be better to uh, have a full-throated endorsement of it. But um, I, I think the committee as a whole should express something to the CPA that makes it clear that there's certainly no conflict um, but hopefully that um, that you see advantages to this CPA, even if you don't endorse every element of it. So I hope you all will think about that and I'll look forward to the discussion at the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Rudy. And I think 
Sean, that's it, correct? Yeah. So I want to thank everyone, including being flexible to move the, the meeting time. And I just had one question of Alicia. Are, Alicia, are, is the morning meeting time now okay with your schedule? Um, no, I still can't do mornings on Fridays. Um, I had a little bit of a schedule change, but I still am working in the school. Okay, so if you can send them to me because there was difficulty getting a quorum together for the 1.30 on Friday, but so next time we're scheduled for the, the on the second we are scheduled for, I'm um, correct, to 8.30, right? Margaret. The morning, yes. Yeah, we got it. The second so, is the morning. So next, the next meeting will be 8.30 because that was, today was going to be the afternoon, but we can um, try to work, get a schedule that will work. Um, that's what we're trying to do. So just stay tuned um, and I'll get more information on Alicia about her work schedule. So I want to thank everybody and wish everyone a very happy um Thanksgiving week, um, hopefully with family, hopefully with some downtime. So we are adjourned. Thank you.